Namaste Ji. May I welcome you today to my heart and also to the Temple of Kriya Yoga. I thought that I would talk to you today about training, maybe training while you're on the spiritual path. I think the first thing that needs to be stressed is that each one of you, each one of you are an individual. Each one of us are unique and distinctive. And so any path of training to self-discipline, we must keep in our mind the awareness that not everybody follows or reflects or responds to the same technique. You must come to try to understand your particular personality. And then it would be wise, having named it or classified it, to try to find a number of people, two, three, four, five if possible, people of the same sex, that you would classify as having the same patternings. Now, if you can find a person that has the same personality classification as yourself, and perchance is five, ten years older, by observing these people, you might be able to, uh, to see error that they have made or foolishnesses that they are making or successes that they have obtained and therefore sort of use them as a template to more clearly understand what works for them and therefore what does not work for them and therefore what most likely will work for you and will not work for you. I think the second principle is that we need to find in some way, shape, or form uh, an awareness that the life that we are living, that the life that you are living, needs to be noble. It needs to have significant meaning to you and in your life. It is, in short, a life that is non-destructive, but that is constructive. It is helping you to find those human values that, since the beginning of recorded history, Great Souls has deemed to be vital, to be important, to be essential in the life that is a noble life. In order to do this, one must Put their life in order. My guru would say, put your house in order. You need to find a way of planning your life, your daily life, your weekly life, your monthly life, your quarterly life, your yearly life, your decade life. You need to put your life in order to simplify your everyday living, to give you more time to relax, to play, more time to think and reflect and to read and study. More time to dive and delve deeper into the inner recesses of your consciousness. You should work very hard, I think, at trying to find greater enjoyment and greater happiness, greater contentment in and from your everyday life, in and from your everyday life. Now I know when, when I say seek enjoyment, excuse me, that some people frown upon this and think that life is not about enjoyment. It's really not about enjoyment, nor is it about suffering. Somewhere between these two extremes, there is a balance point. I call it contentment. I call it happiness. I call it satisfaction. We must organize our lives to remove from it the chaos, to simplify it, to prioritize it, so that we have time for those things that are vital. It 
we organize our life so that we have time to practice our sadhana. But what is the sadhana that we are to practice? What are the sadhana that we are to practice? The sadhana that you should be practicing depends on your goal in your life. What do you wish to accomplish in this lifetime? If you want to be a pianist, then your sadhana is to practice the piano. If you're to be a singer, your sadhana is to practice singing. If you're a linguist, your sadhana is to practice languages. What is your sadhana? What is your goal? What are you trying to accomplish? Well, independent of the contentment, the peace of mind, we are trying to see the order in our life or the disorder and to put more order into our lives. We're looking and delving deep within the mysteries of life to grasp to begin to understand the meaning and the purpose and the direction of life itself. Now, the next point is very difficult and I think very easily misunderstood. I have said one needs to learn to obtain a reasonable security. Now, security is more than anything else a mental attitude. To feel secure in life is to realize that life itself is not hostile to us. And yet all of our training and oftentimes all of our encounters with life and with people and things in life unconsciously and as it were automatically teach us that life is hostile. Maybe it's just we who are hostile to life, or people hostile to people. But we need to grasp what is the true nature of life? What is our own true nature? And how might we reestablish this harmony and peace and tranquility and serenity and equanimity between ourselves and ourselves, between ourselves and others, between ourselves and life itself? And therefore, the next patterning is really to learn to communicate. It's so hard to learn to communicate. So many disasters could be averted if we'd only learn to communicate. So many hurts could be removed. So many suffering years of anguish could be removed and not happen if we could just learn to communicate. Too often I've heard people say, well, it's better they don't know. But maybe these people are wrong. Maybe it is better to know and to communicate. Yes, it, it does take a strong soul. But I think the strength of the soul becomes strong in understanding that yes, and learning to walk we will fall and skin our knee and maybe break a tooth. But we learn to walk. And in learning to walk, we learn to run. And in our dream, we dream that we can fly, that we can levitate, that we can ascend to the higher dream, to the greater dream, to the nobler life. This is the quality of the mind. This is the value of the pathway to learn to communicate. Observe so clearly the miscommunications between people, why it is caused, oftentimes by intonation, oftentimes by facial expression, oftentimes by an unwise use of a word, but more often by not saying what is so obvious and assuming you know, therefore they know. To communicate that you care, 
to communicate that you love. And yes, unfortunately, to communicate oft times that we are really helpless to help those in pain and suffering, other than to love them and make them aware that we love them and make them aware that it is part of life, the struggle to remove ourselves from the bonds of emotionality and loss and disappointment. It is natural. It is not to be feared. It is not to be encouraged. But it is not to be feared. Learn to see how people do communicate. Try to see the wiser souls how they communicate and what they communicate and the way in which they communicate, and oftentimes the timing of their communications, and learn to emulate those great communicators. My beloved Guru Shalaji was a great communicator. His timing was unbelievable, impeccable. And always his communications, no matter what he said, no matter how he said it, always was with love and with humor and with a very genuine non-judgmentalness. We who knew him, we who studied with him, we who shared years with him are blessed indeed. But all the great souls are dead or dying. Where therefore do we find a new ritta a new pattern, a living soul that can show us the way with love and with humor and with genuineness, understanding, without excessive pride or excessive egoism. They're there, quietly moving through life. It is we who must seek them out, these great and noble souls, and learn from them. Many of us do not emotionally trust people. We've been burnt by too many salesmen, so to speak. I think the goal of life for many people, therefore, is to learn through books. And as I have said, uh, reading autobiographies is a wonderful way of understanding human mind. Maybe to read biographies, but autobiographies are far more penetrating. To study history, and to see the re reoccurrent problems, why they occur, why they reoccur, why they occurred at all in the first place. But above all, learn to communicate with other people. But above that, far, far beyond that, and above that, and more vital to that, is learn to communicate to yourself. Learn to be aware of your body as it communicates to you. Learn to communicate to your body. Learn to communicate with your mind. And listen to your mind that it can communicate to you. And as you learn to communicate both ways to body and mind and from body and mind, you will recognize rapidly your ability to communicate with other souls. My guru used to say, seek out the golden means. Stay centered. Stay away from this extremism or that extremism. Try to stay centered and follow the golden means. Stay away from extremism. Clarity of thought, clarity of purpose. Now, if you ask most people, how are things going? They usually will either directly talk about money or indirectly talk about money in terms of talking about their job. For most people today, the career or the job that they are having occupies the key place in consciousness. The amount of time preparing for the job, traveling to the job, working on the job, coming home, and preparing yourself again to return to the job. Career or job is vital. Therefore, try 
try to find great joy in your job. Try to find meaning in your job or your work. And if you cannot, then ask yourself, what job would give me great meaning or value or satisfaction? And then seek that out. It does not mean that you have to change your job this week or next week or next year. But prepare. Remember once, uh, 40, 50 years ago, a young man coming down to Shelley and said, yeah, uh, yeah, you're right, Shelley, I am rather miserable. And Shelley said, well, what would make you happy? And the man said, well, I want to be wealthy. That would make me happy. And Shelley says, I think that's a good idea. Why don't you do that? It's good. And then Shelley said, well, over the last year, how many books on wealth have you read? None. How many lectures have you attended regarding wealth? None. Uh, have you set up uh, your budget for this year or last year or this month? No. And he kept asking the questions like this, and the young man kept saying, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't. And Shelley looked at him with a beautiful smile and said, I can see you really want to be wealthy. And I'm never sure that the man ever understood what he was saying. The man wanted to be wealthy, then he must immerse himself in wealth, wealth language, wealth symbols, and prepare and study and learn and practice. It's true of anything. And I'm suggesting that we all emerge yourself totally and completely totally and completely in this thing that we call life. It's a wonderful thing. Yes, I am aware that for most people it is an absolute nightmare. But each one of us has the power to awaken from that nightmare. Each one of us has the power to move out into and begin to obtain the dream that is vital to us. Yes, it does take study, memorization, practice, discipline, self-discipline, and tons and tons of work, and rarely is it accomplished in a day or week or year. But there should be great joy and great satisfaction in recognizing and realizing I am working towards my goal. Therefore, should I not be happy? I think each one of us need to ask ourselves, what is it about my personality that is somewhat negative? What is it about my personality that is somewhat positive? And to strengthen the positive factors and neutralize the negative or soften the rough edges of the personality. Again and again in life, those who succeed are those who have, in simple words, people's skills. It is not always the person that has the greatest knowledge, but the person that has communicative skills. I can remember back 50 years when I was working as a research chemist in a perfume cosmetic uh, corporation. We had a large department of research and development. We had this genius, and the genius was being paid a fortune back then for his skill in developing perfumes and such. But the bosses were very unhappy with him, absolutely, totally unhappy with him. because they just could never find out what he's doing. They could, he would never answer their questions or answer them in such a way they had no idea what they, he was talking about. And then they decided to fire him. And they thought, no, that's, he's too good of a man. We can't afford to fire him. 
Besides that, now he knows all our trade secrets. So what they decided to do is to give him extra work and kept piling extra work intentionally until one day he complained to the boss, there's too much, I can't do it all. And the boss had already pre-planned, said, yes, I do understand that. Uh, I didn't realize so much. You should, you should hire, we will hire an assistant for you to carry on the work. And they went through about 50 applications, which back then was a lot of applications. They didn't take another man with a PhD in chemistry. They took a man who had people skills, a person who could communicate with this genius and therefore could communicate with the boss. Of course, they paid the young man twice the amount that they were paying this creative genius. And of course, the young man understood that if the genius ever found out that his assistant was being paid twice as much, he'd immediately be fired. And I watched this young man <clears throat> work like hell, do everything he was told to do, and then some, made suggestions, anything that went right, he gave his boss the credit, anything went wrong, he immediately took on the guilt and said, it's my fault. He built quite an excellent communication between the two. And then the young man could communicate back to the upper echelon management so that they would know what was happening. It's about personality. It's about communications. The ability to understand where people are at and what people problems that they have and to communicate with them talk with them, to listen to them. But primarily, I repeat, if we cannot communicate with ourselves, I am thinking it would be impossible for us to communicate with anybody else. I am thinking that if we have really rough edges to our personality, then all the knowledge that we have and all the communication skills that we think we have will fail us because people will be turned off by our rough edges our moodinesses, our agitation, our negative thinking, our limited thinking, an uninspirational attitude. And so we need to turn inward to meditate, to soften, to remove our prejudices, to become less judgmental about others and therefore about ourselves, about ourselves and therefore about others and then move forward from that direction to accomplish your goal. Remember, you are immortal. It's a frightening thing. You're immortal. You should learn to get along with yourself. You're immortal. You should learn to enjoy life. And yes, you might have to pack a lunch because immortality does last a long time. What is it that you would do if you had an infinite amount of money? What is it that you would do if you had infinite wisdom and creative talent? What would you do if you were totally free? I think it's that what you should really be working towards, not with the realization that you'll be able to accomplish it next week or next year, or maybe not even next lifetime, but to begin to work towards it. If you do that, you can be quite content. If you start doing that, you realize there's nobody you can blame. And that the anger that you may have for other people, thinking that they have obstructed you, will dissolve away. I think what I am saying is we need to find our place in life. But each one of us chooses that place and have chosen that place by past actions and past attitudes.
We were talking about the importance of sharing your life with someone or people. I have suggested for decades teaching, whether it be Hatha Yoga or, or something else. Try to find a niche where you can serve people, help people. Those more fortunate than you are those less fortunate than you. But something that has meaning to you. Now in order to do that, and in order to do that successfully, you need, we all need to become emotionally more mature, uh, more stable, if you will. And so again, we need to tarka or daily reflect the end of each day and ask yourself, how emotional was my personality? How emotional was my mind? How attached was my mind? In other words, what upset you during the day? <coughs> I think that's important to ask. And then they, when you find out what it is, ask why and try to find the root cause or to balance it out through suggestion, through reliving it, through forgiving. For any of the psychological techniques that I have taught you over the decades, be emotionally more stable. Be emotionally more stable. Another approach to this uh, success in dealing with people, whether we talk in terms of marriage, or as a teacher, or as a member of a household, or as a member of a work group, is to be more content. Again, each day, try to ask yourself, how content were you? Where were you malcontent? Not so much the degree, but where, what caused it? And psychologically work through power of suggestion, through auto-hypnosis, through meditation, through mantra, through yantra, through concentration, through all the techniques that are in all of the yogic textbooks, become more content. And as you become more content, you will see that there is less emotionality, and as there is less emotionality, there is a greater degree of satisfaction with life, and therefore a greater degree of stability. It is to recognize mystically that heaven lies within. It's a state of consciousness within us. Many people walk this earth plane and for them it is sheer hell. And other people walk this plane and it's sheer heaven. It is primarily a state of consciousness, a vibratory rate. Now, if you say to me, is there a location that we could say, this is heaven? I would have to answer yes. But how do we get from here, this neutral ground, as it were, to heaven? It is by redialing the mind. It is by lifting, turning inward, centering, and lifting our vibration so that we attune to this location and, as it were, can then go to that location. As I've said so often, the function of a teacher, the function of a guru, is to help people by helping them to stand on their own two feet. Again, observe the world around you and see those people that seem to be content, seem to be more emotionally mature or stable. See those people who understand that inwardness is where satisfaction arises. Try to find those people who are capable, or seemingly capable, of standing upon their own two feet. Learn from them by examining their way of life, by examining what they think, what they believe, what they do not believe by observing their actions, their verbal actions. Yes, learn to stand on your own two feet. Now, we're not talking to be an island unto yourself. We're talking about becoming part of the solution to life rather than a continual part of the problem. It doesn't begin in heaven 
and it doesn't begin in the outward world. The key thought of yoga is it begins deep within you, for you, and definitely deep within me, for me. We have to rewire, reprogram our, our thinking mechanism, our desiring mechanisms, our emotional mechanisms, our perceptional mechanisms. We have to rewire and rethink and recondition ourselves from the difficult emotional patterns of the past and events of the past. We have to look forward with hope and aspiration and understanding. Aham Brahmasmi. You are the creative principle. I am the creative principle. And we can change. We can improve. We can change the past. We can open up the future. We can dare to dream our dream here and now and be content in recognizing that we are working and rowing our boat. Row, row your boat gently down the stream, merrily, merrily, merrily. Life is but a dream. Dream a wondrous dream. Dream the dream you would dream, and when your mind says, I can't, Reaffirm that it can. When your mind freezes and said, oh, I don't dare do that, I might fall on my face. Buy a brush that you and I might dust ourselves off again as we fall. I've told you so many times because it has left such an intense impression. As a very young child, we was at a picnic and my mother entered me in a hurdle race I had all ready and I wanted to win for her sake so she'd be proud of me. And the gun went off and I started running and running and running. And there was the hurdle and I jumped over it. And I was running and running and I turned back and looked behind me and I saw that most of the people had tripped over the hurdle. And I was way ahead and I knew I was going to win and she'd be so proud of me. And whack! At that moment, something hit me. Or I hit something. And I fell to the ground. And I looked up, and as I was looking up, trying to reorientate my mind, gather myself together, I saw people running past me. I had hit a second hurdle. And I remember so well thinking, how unfair that there's more than one hurdle in this race. And I think sometimes this is what people think in their immaturity, as I did in my immaturity, that. We've had our hard knocks, we've jumped our hurdle, we've made it. Certainly there can't be another one. But there are. I think little ones daily, and weekly and monthly. Little ones uh, in the home life, in the work life, in our inner spiritual life. Life is a hurdle race, of which there are many hurdles. But as we learn to be prepared to recognize there's another one right around the corner. Not with fear, but in terms of preparation. As we master the little hurdles, the big ones are <clears throat> much easier to handle. <clears throat> much, much easier to handle. And I think that that is the important factor, to prepare for the hurdle race. Yes, I must admit from my own life and other people's lives, Sometimes the hurdles are unbelievable. And as someone told me once, Green Indy, if you can't jump over it, run around it, tunnel under it, slip through it, but keep moving forward, Green Indy, dream your dream. And so I'm repeating, my beloved ones, dream your dream. Dare to dream. And when the mind says it can't, reaffirm that it can. When you see the mind slowing down and hesitating because it's fearful that it's going to make a mistake and make a fool and fall on our face, recognize that is how we learn to walk, by falling down, by standing up one more time, then we fall down. There is no one, not a single soul, has not learned this lesson. We who walk, 
walk only because we dared to stand up one more time than we have fallen. If the goal is important, if the goal is important, dare to fall on your face for it. Dare to live for it. Dare to dream it. It is possible. And it doesn't matter whether the world says it's a big dream or a small dream, a noble dream, or maybe even an ignoble dream, a meaningful dream or a meaningless dream. That's not really the value point. The value point is that you dare to dream and that you dream and you succeed in your dream. Why? Because then you will say, aha, I can dream any dream and I can have my dream. And as I have said to you so often, at some point in this ability to dream, you and I, we will give up the dream of mankind and pick up the dream of God. This is good. Let us try. I think the next point in trying to lead a life of service, trying to help people, is to recognize that there is really, if you permit me to say it, only one reality for you. And it's you. It's your mind, if you prefer. The mind has filters, the ears have filters, the eyes have filters. And we tend to see more what we wish to see and hope to see or fear to see than to see it as it is. You are the reality for you. You are the center of the universe. It is your mind that needs to be worked on for you and my mind for me continuously and consciously. That the filters, the variations caused by the filters will be removed and we might see life as it is and hear life as it is and understand life as it is to be understood. Like that. There's really nothing wrong with you. Absolutely, really, there's nothing wrong with you. There is nothing wrong with you, my beloved. Nor is there anything wrong with me. But we have this instrument called the mind and the personality. And too often, because of hurts and expectations that are unfulfilled, we get some rough edges, some defensive mechanisms. And the mind, as I say, has some rather dark filters. And we must dare to improve our mind, to improve our personality, to remove the rough edges, to remove the dark filters that we might accept life and see it as it is and see it as it is accepted. And in accepting life, learning totally to accept our humanness, I think that's the problem with religion. It oftentimes tends to make us think that human beings are awful and life is awful and God is good. But God is life and life is God. And you are a part of that life God and that God life and not apart from it. It's a unity, and the reality begins by seeing it through your eyes and hearing it through your ears and thinking it through your brain. The reality begins within your working with your personality, your mind. Accept yourself, accept your mind, and move on. Accept your mind, see its flaws. Polish them and move on. See your fears and your hopes and accept them. Modify them, simplify them, reach out for them and move on. We need to learn to attune to life. We need to attune to life. But if we're lost in our ego self, if we're lost in fears or hopes or cravings or desires, 
we attune to these emotionalities, these desires, these fears, these doubts, these hurts. And so we need to let go. We need to detach ourselves from the negativity of the past. We need to detach ourselves from the memory tracks of the past that are so negative. Not to blot them out, but to call up from deep within the positive experiences. I used to hear people say all the time, oh, I've had so much bad karma from the past and so much bad karma in this lifetime. Oh, terrible, 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 woe is me, and woe is me. Oh, I've lived 200, 300,000 times. Oh, it is so terrible, it is so awful. Look at all the bad karma I have. This may be true, but what they're failing to do is to activate all the positive karmic events of the past 200, 300,000 years. Bring them that are asleep in your memory banks. Bring them up, awaken them, bring them forward and draw upon the goodness of the past, the wisdom of the past, the beauty of the past, the love of the past. Quit emphasizing and holding on to this one thought. It's like, you know, I block out the sun with my thumb if I get the thumb close enough to me. That unbelievable? I can block out a mountain with my thumb if I get my thumb close enough to me. <clears throat> Do you understand that? If we get our pain, no matter how little it is, close enough to us, close enough to us, it'll block out the mountain, it'll block out the sun and the sunlight of God. Throw down all those things that you're attached to, all that pain and anguish and suffering and resentment. Let go of it now. And dive deep within the pool of existence, in the pool of your wonderment, of the things past, the beauty, the joy, the successes, the loves, the attainments. Draw upon them, bring them to the focus and forefront of your mind. And, my beloved, move on from that point. Attuned to life. Attuned to life. What you're doing, what most of us are doing, is attuning to a memory tag, a very small vignette of the memory past. Attuned to life. Let go of this small thing that's blocking the beauty and the light of God consciousness, of happiness, of joy, of success, of fruitation and fulfillment. Become detached from the negative and attune to life, the positive, and move on. Yes, all of us at some time are in great pain and doubts, concerns. It is true. true. But in our attunement to life, in our attunement to the ecosystem, our attunement to the animals, our attunement to human beings, let us remember that there are others in greater pain right now and that need help. They need love. They need understanding. They need strength. They need you. Seek to help those in need now. Wisely, generously, spiritually, unselfishly, unemotionally, become part of the solution. Lose your ego self in the service to others and you will find deep within you the divine self that you are. And in that service you will find that that service <clears throat> is and has polished your personality, is and has 
remove so many of the dark filters that exist in all our minds and that we see afresh, we hear afresh, my beloved, we love afresh, we seek afresh, we find anew afresh. Life wonders, life beautiful, life meaningful, here and now. So many people not having this awareness, they are thinking, oh, my mother, my father, they owe me this. Oh, my boss, my company owes me this. Oh, the government owes me this. Oh, life owes me this. They're, they're as it were, takers. We are here to learn not to continue to be takers, but rather to come to understand within our limited personalities and our limited wealth and our limited intellect and our limited creativity, how to be a service, how to give to the world and the needs of the world. I am thinking. And in that serving, we do forget our own pain momentarily. And as we forget it, even though it be only momentarily, we have broken the magnetic field and we are capable again and again of letting go of our own hurt and our own sadness and our own disappointment and find joy in helping others to find joy and greater freedom and greater happiness and greater maturity. That, I think, is... Uh, I think what I've been trying to say to you, if I were to summarize it, I would simply say, do that that blesses others. Do that which blesses the entities in life. Do that which blesses life itself. And in so blessing, your mind, your body, will be blessed and will be instruments of contentment and of happiness and of joy, and of serenity, and equanimity, and harmony, and peace, and of wisdom. So you will see, and can see afresh, that your life does have meaning to people, that your life does have meaning to life, that your life does have meaning, and purpose, and direction. loved. Be at peace. Enter deeply and often into your meditative state and there quiet the mind which is so tumultuous in all of us. Go find the quiet mind deep within. Find the tranquility the serenity which is peace. Be at peace deep within. Attune to your inner self deep within and bring that depth of mind out into the world to bless all that you see. Be thou blessed now. Be thou blessed at this moment. Be thou forever triply blessed that you will continue to be an ever greater blessing to life and all life forms. Namaste Ji. Namaste Ji. 
नमस्ते जी Thank you.